But as I prayed in this season about what to start with, um, I kept asking the Lord, like, God, what do you want me to talk about? What do you want? This is my first time back, a little nervous. And I just heard this phrase, remind my soul. Over and over again, I said, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, and I just heard it again. Remind my soul, which those words echo because that's what this passage, this book, Psalms 103, this chapter highlights. Um, here's what I come to every year about this time. And as I get older, you ever find as you get older in the faith, you either become so resistant to things or you just give up in a lot of ways of all the old things that used to tick you off and used to make, I mean, right, if you would have known me 20 years ago or 10 years ago, I mean, I was um, angry church planter mode for a long time. I was super righteous and justified, charismatic reformer, still am. I just keep them in the closet a little bit more than I used to. Amen. Um, just as I've gotten older, um, even in relationships, you just kind of go, oh gosh, it's just not worth fighting anymore. And one of those areas is self-sufficiency. And what I mean by self-sufficiency is I can do a very good job of holding up my own little Christendom and making you believe that I'm really in a good place. Usually, unless you really know me, then you know I'm just a quack. And as I've thought about what we need to walk through, I've really been hearing the Lord say this, the word abide, which we all know in John about the Lord says, and here's the thing is Jesus calls us close to him. And I've heard this a lot. And I'm not just trying to pick on one person or two people this week, but I've heard in many conversations over the last month, you know what, man, I've been doing this a long time, but I don't even know if I really know how to give him everything. I got to be honest, I've been doing this a long time. I don't know if I really know what it is to sit at his feet and to walk in his power and to walk in his presence. See, there's a counterfeit Christianity. And it's action-based. And, and as we sat at this USCON thing, they had these, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a little critical spirit. And my first reaction to everything is, uh-uh. Anybody else in the house? Right? Yeah? Your first discernment is, no way. And so they brought in these soul shepherds um, to talk to all of our pastors in the Antioch movement, these soul shepherds. And I'm like, and you know, <laughs> I'm so judgmental. I'm such a jerk. Uh, you know, this, this guy, he's up in his 50s, and he's got his wife, and she's Californian, but she is a 100,000% Texas woman, big blonde hair, smiling, hey, y'all. You know what I mean? And they're up there talking and I just, I got to be honest, the content could be awesome, but I've got to suffer through the first half an hour trying to get over my jerkiness. Like, and so I'm like, all right, she's got something good. And then they kept talking and they kind of blew me away because they started talking about Christendom and, they, and we're going to probably cover some of this together over the next however long, but it's just shepherding my soul. Um, by the way, if you don't know how to shepherd your soul, you're going to end up like where many of us are now waiting on somebody else to fix things for you, waiting on church to be the right dynamic. And they talk about this acronym, it's CHRIST, and every, every letter has, you know, a saying next to it. And they talk, you first become a believer, and so you're a Christian, and um, the next is whatever, however they titled in H, but you, you get discipled, and then the third one was you're serving in the church, and then it goes on and talk, there's like the spirit-filled ministry and all this activation, but in the middle... There's this, there's this little thing that they talk about, and it's called the wall. Everybody say the wall. Somebody sing a Pink Floyd song. No, don't sing a Pink Floyd song. And they talk about this wall, and, and here's what I believe. How many of you feel like in your faith and in your walk, you've actually hit a wall? If not once, more than once. Thank you. There's one honest man in the room. There's a Who has been preaching this summer? Raise your hand if you feel like you've ever hit a wall spiritually. Oh, look at that. Praise God. Honesty comes with loud vocals. And they started talking about this wall. And here's what I've honestly thought about Christianity is um, I'm baptized. I love Jesus. I'm all in without question. Number two is um, I'm, <laughs> I've been discipled and I disciple other people. And number three is I'm serving. I'm, I'm doing this thing. I'm a pastor of a church. And, and, and then honestly, that's been life for me. Like the bar stops there. Like I have been tired for so long and feeling like I keep butting up against this thing over and over and over again. And to me, that's just what Christianity is. I'm a son 
and I'm a soldier, and I'm a lot better at being a soldier than I am a son. That's one of my biggest confessions in the kingdom. You won't find very many more people that's not in for the cause. I'll lay down my life, my family, whatever he wants. I don't blame him for anything. Bad things happen, and I know, God, why did you do I've never done that in my entire life. I'm in. <laughs> but here's what I begin to find. That will only get you so far. That will only get you so far. God didn't create you to be a soldier in itself. God created you and redeemed you to be sons and daughters. And there is an intimacy in sonship and daughtership that a soldier alone will never know. And as they talked about this wall thing, Everybody hits the wall. Some people, it's a month. Some people, it's a decade. Some people, it's three years. I feel like I've been in one for like three or four years, y'all, of just bang, oh, this is just what it is to do ministry. And their thing was, this wall can be the most beneficial place in your walk ever if you know what it is and you know how to respond. Their thing was, here's the wall as a gift because it calls you on the mat of what this son and daughtership thing is versus soldiership. Listen to me. There is a place in Christ Jesus that is deeper than any of us will know on our own, and it's possible. You can be, we can be men and women who love God's word. We can be men and women that can walk into hellfire with peace. We can be people with real joy but a soldier alone will never get there. Only sons and daughters come out of the wall. And so essentially what this wall thing is, is an opportunity to go deep with God. And when you come out of the bottom, when you come up out of that, that's when real spirit-led ministry happens. That's when real freedom and joy, the, when most of us soldiers don't like this term, let go and let God. I've wanted to smack people who have told me that before. Freedom is letting go, bro. That's control. But in the end, not giving them any credit for their statement. It's true. But I don't know that without being a son or daughter. And so I don't know if that resonates <laughs> with any of you. I think that a lot of, I, let me say this, I know that a lot of people in this room have been in a wall for a very long time. And you either feel guilty because you're not a good enough Christian, or number two, <laughs> um, you just think this is normal. And here's what I think, God, as we move into this new season, you know, standing on the truth, loving people, whatever comes against the church, it is what it is. I can soldier through that, and so can many of you, but I don't want to just soldier through it. I want to be a son. I want to be secure in who I am. I want to hold on to the tassels of Jesus. Some of y'all are so tired of fighting. And the Lord said, I never called you to fight that fight. I called you to take my yoke. It's easy. And many of us go inside, if we're going to be honest. Many of us go, I know Jesus. I just don't know how. I don't know how. And by the way, let me tell you about personal revival. Personal revival starts with those words, Lord, I don't know how. I don't know how to do this anymore. I can't do this alone anymore. I can't make this marriage thing work. I can't make sure we're financially secure enough. I can't do relationships. I just can't do Christianity. I can't do church. I can't do any of it, any of it on my own anymore. And many of us think that the Lord's sitting there going, oh, you're such an idiot. You've let me down. I believe without question, the Lord is saying, amen. I stand in the door, knock, open the door, and I will come in and I will eat with you, be with you. So this morning, my invitation is this. <laughs> the wall is actually a really great place if we go down and we don't try to scale it. And so if you're tired this morning, looking at the season that you've been in, I'm just inviting you to the journey that I'm on as we move into wartime, let's be soldiers, but let's be soldiers that are baptized in the Father heart of God. 
Some of you think, well, you don't know me. I'm new at Christianity. I've been such a scuzz bucket. I really sinned. I'm not perfect. Uh, welcome to all the other believers on the face of the earth. Amen? So over the next couple of weeks, um, that's just a pre-sermon. We'll be here till two. Um, mostly joking. Um, Psalms 103 is this, um, it's a song from David. And we're not sure when uh, in David's journey uh, it takes place. And as we open our scriptures, or you can see it up here on uh, the screen, Psalms 103, 1 through 5 is all we're going to tackle today. And it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your inequity, who heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your mouth, excuse me, not your mouth, your youth is renewed like the eagles. Now, the thing that's great about David is the later in his life it goes, the deeper and the more crying out and the more heartfelt the Psalms get. His story gets, because David goes through a young guy, he gets called, he becomes king, he has all this stuff in the middle, he does something really stupid in the middle of that, he sees God's redemption, suffers great loss, one of his sons betray him, and as he gets older, he starts to write these worship songs. And that's what we get in a lot of the Psalms, David's just penning his emotions and his heart in a song to the Lord, and we have the blessing to be able to have that. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, as I call him, Spurgey Baby says, we should attribute it to his later years when he had a higher sense of the preciousness of pardon because a keener sense of sin than in his younger days. His clear sense of the frailty of life indicates his weaker years as also does the very fullness of his praiseful gratitude. Back to the wall. <laughs> there seems to be a God-given point in all of our lives where we just do this. And I believe that part of the scripture today that we're going to read is one of those, how do I do this thing that, that David lines out for us? And so as you read the beginning of that text, we're just going to take it line by line for a minute. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. What's happening here? Here's great. David is talking to himself. Right? How many of you talk to yourself? <laughs> uh, when we usually think about people who talk to themselves, we think about the crazy dude that's walking down Douglas, right? You know what I mean, that guy? That guy, I mean, some of us have been that guy before. Thank God we've been redeemed. Um, I, I, I was at a quick trip. God help me. I was at a quick trip one day, and I'm trying to mind my own business, you know, got some social phobias. And all of a sudden, I'm looking in the cooler, and all I hear is a flippity flopping, flipping, flipping, flopping. This, this girl starts screaming and yelling like two doors over. And I'm the only other person standing anywhere close to her. I'm like, oh, gosh. And so I'm like, do I make eye contact? Is she talking to me? And then I look over, and she said, sorry, I have Tourette's. And so I felt really bad for this baby girl because she, she was out there bursting. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even, I didn't even hear you. I didn't even hear you. It's, it's all good. I mean, I didn't. I was just, yeah, I mean, heck, yeah, yeah. The pop makes me mad, too. Yeah, believe it. You know, darn that Mountain Dew. Uh, often when I think about people who talk to themselves, I think about moms. Mom, you know that time when you're about to kill your child and you walk away and you're talking to yourself, you know, you got your hand up and you're like, God, if you don't stop that kid right now, I'm going to smack the face up. With and then, not that any of you moms in here do that, but I've heard. But David is doing something for us that is so, what I believe to be so significantly critical to our walk. He's modeling something. And he does this over and over again in the Psalms. We see in places like Psalm 145 too, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. Psalm 66, uh, 1 through 4, is kind of like this outward praise for joy to God. All the earth sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome is your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Paul is leading himself. The question is, why? 
Um, here's something that's true from the very beginning of time to now is this. The soul forgets. You hear me? The soul forgets. Cain and Abel come and bring this worship offering to the Lord. They both do it. One knew who he was standing in front of. The other one had forgotten. Over and over again, think about the lowest time. By the way, is there any time in your walk and your faith when the goodness of God and the truth of God have not been abundantly true and clear? Has God ever taken a time off in your life? Has God ever been weak? Did God ever sleep in? Has God ever not made any of his promises true and rich, whether you perceive them to be or not? No, he's always who he is. What happens is all of the promises of God are true. I am, we, are, we, are the, we are new creations, right? We are the righteousness of God. We are empowered. We have full of the Holy Spirit. We are more than conquerors. We are sons and daughters. Those things are true, but guess what? You are not default wired to remember that. There is this thing going on inside of you that's been going on since the fall. Spiritual warfare in your mind, in your spirit, in your soul, battling for what is true. W.R. Dans, our favorite Canadian hood poet, said, When the soul forgets, the power fades, the joy dissipates, and our identity becomes clouded. You know what's wrong with some of us in here? We've just forgotten. We've forgotten the goodness of God. And I don't mean cerebrally. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, God's good. How many of you here that are believers will say, oh, God's not good? I don't think that. But I'm talking about to your soul, to your spirit. How many times have we gone into a fight or a breaking of a relationship or battles in our marriage or in our addictions, and we walk in like people who have forgotten who they are? We've forgotten who's with us. We forgot that the power that rose Christ from the dead is the same power that's in me. It's not that it wasn't true. I just forgot. Our soul forgets. And here's the reason why this is important and why this psalm is important. Paul Tripp said, no one is more influential in your life than you because no one talks to you more than you do. <laughs> think about it for a minute. We often think that what we think, what goes on in our brain, is just who we are, right? Oh, I have bad thoughts. I did it. Um, biblically, that is a complete fallacy. It's garbage. Your thoughts are not who you are. Your brain, your mind is a part of your flesh, and the scripture is very clear that we need to take that thing, beat that thing like a bad neighbor's dog. Don't send that to Peter. When Romans 12, 2 says, therefore, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We're like, yes, doctrine, renew my mind of thee. But you know what? You need to renew your mind from your number one enemy, you. The devil can tempt you. The devil can lay things out at you. He can send stuff at you, but he can't make you bite. You don't have to do what he says. The scripture's clear. Resist the devil. He flees from you, right? The only reason we fall is because we become unconvinced and we make choices that don't honor who we are and what God has said. The soul forgets. You got to convince your mind. Here's a question. What kind of influence do you have over yourself? We all talk about, oh, my influence was da, 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 Dr. Davis, Kobe. Obviously, we look alike. Me and Kobe ball it up, right? I'm an influencer. How, many do you, how much do you hear that today on YouTube? I'm an influencer. I'm an influencer. Uh-huh. How are you at influencing yourself? Have you ever even asked that question? Do you realize, and you say, well, I don't know. I'm just sinful. I can't get control of myself. Wrong. The scriptures say that the Holy Spirit of God lives in us. And here's one of your biggest battles that happens every day. It's got nothing to do with your spouse. It's got nothing to do with your kids. It's got nothing to do with your job. It has nothing to do with your body. It has to do with <laughs> what you're going to believe today in here.
Paul says, bless the Lord. I said, David, I knew I was going to do that. My wife just goes. <laughs> I knew it last night I was going to say Paul too. I was trying so hard. Thank you. Wife. And so here, here's, here's, here's a great tool with Paul talking to himself helps us when the mind forgets. Die, David. I'm going to lose the rest of you for the rest of the sermon because I didn't say, David, 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 David. All right, got it. There's going to be a lot of editing on this week's sermon. Um, this is why David talking to himself is so on point for us. And he says, um, bless the Lord. That's what he starts off with. That word bless literally means to kneel with the idea of adoration thankfulness, and praise. Paul is talking to himself, don't do it every time. <laughs> this is not going to work. <laughs> Shush. Okay, David, oh, sweet Jesus. The problem was I got into it and now I can't get out of it. If you would have just left me alone, I would have been fine. I'm, I'm, very, I'm honestly very sorry. Um, David, <laughs> just transpose every time. If you hear Paul, it means David. Unless I'm talking about Paul. <laughs> but David says, he talks to his soul, and David says, bless him. When was the last time you ever told yourself to bless God? Like, especially in white people church, we bless you, Lord. That's not a phrase that we use a whole lot. But it's a, it's a biblical phrase. Like, bless the Lord. And so David is talking to himself and he says, bless the Lord. It blesses and honors God when his creatures praise him and thank him appropriately. Part one. But it also more important, not more importantly, it also blesses us to bless him because our soul gets a reset in the reality of heaven. Do you know a great way to take your eyes off heaven? I mean, excuse me, an eyes off the earth and get out of the pit is to put your eyes on Jesus. But not only put your eyes on Jesus, there's another step. Bless him. And guess what? The default in your heart isn't just, you didn't just get baptized and go, Woo! Thank you, Lord Jesus, for my kid. Thank you for that sandwich. Thank you for that bathroom. Thank you for that. I mean, it just doesn't happen. You don't just praise him naturally because your flesh is saying, Ah! Uh -uh. Bring it back. Take it back on you. Do this. Do that. And David just says to his soul, he says, Listen, praise him. The best way to remind your soul is to worship him. A heart that praises him on purpose. And he goes on beyond the blessed. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Not only is David talking to himself, bless the Lord, but he's being very specific. So we talk about your soul, right? So your body, this external thing that dies and gets all whatever nasty, turns in the dust, the spirits, this immaterial part of humanity that connects us with God, like God breathes spirit into us. And as believers, we have the spirit with this, with, that's within us. It's how we connect to the Lord. And then there's your soul. It's like your essence of humanity. It's your being. It's who you are. It's your mind, your thoughts. And David is being very specific. He's like, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Why? Because your soul is made up of the things that are evil and wicked. And we need a reminder to encourage yourself to worship him. And then he says, all that is within me. Paul is being clear. He wants his entire self to be activated in blessing the Lord. There's always been disingenuous worship in David's life. And in the, in the scriptures, um, we see this. Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament, what happens? Acts 5, worship, just overflow, given to God. They lie <laughs> about how much loot they got and how much they gave uh, to the disciples and what happens to them. They died. And the dumbest thing was they didn't have to lie. This had to be genuine. They just had to be real about what they did and what they didn't do. The problem was they lied, which was an issue with the Holy Spirit. You look at the end of the Old Testament and the book of Malachi is talking about this obscene, fake worship that happens inside of God's church. Back to the Cain and Abel thing again. Cain and Abel, both of them come to worship. One of them comes with gifts that honor the Lord. The other one comes with a heart that does not. They both showed up, but one of them had disingenuous worship. 
And I don't know if I know of a single person in this room that ever has had that problem. Isaiah 29, 13, we see this. And the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me, with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Um, disingenuous worship. When we come and we just lift our voices to the Lord and we just sing a song, I believe it's dishonoring to the God of heaven. The second part of that is when we come with disingenuous worship that comes out of a place that doesn't come out of a place of overflow, we rob ourselves of something. We always, can, and, and, and worship is such a, can we please, for the love of God, stop talking about worship like it's a, a preference, like it's a song, it's a, it's a kind of music, it's a kind of thing, it's this kind of thing, like worship is the overflow. If you don't like the music here, okay, praise God, right? I mean, l- listen, I can't stand Christian radio. But I also know that some of you guys love Christian radio, and I'm an old punk rock snob. Anything on the radio, anything that sounds like Chris Tomlin, right? I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to listen to it. Turn it off quick, right? And then I just go back into my extended long worship sessions. But I know that some of you love, love Christian, and I think it's awesome because it worships. But can I worship to it? Yeah, I can. They're talking about the Lord, right? Like my heart, it's a heart issue, like, I can go anywhere. I can, man, we don't even know what it's like to be in China in a basement worshiping. We probably wouldn't like their style of worship. But in the end, I bet it would blow our doors off. Amen. David is saying this to his soul. No way am I halfway in on this. No way am I going to do this to him. No way am I going to be half-hearted in my worship of the king. And David had to convince himself. When was the last time you convinced yourself that you had to be convinced? And by the way, you have to be convinced. Don't act like you're holier than anybody else in this room. You ever, oh, I don't feel like worshiping today. Oh, I don't feel like praising him. I'm just depressed. And, and <laughs> man, even, man, some of the best worship I've ever been at is in a deathbed room. Because when God's people praise him and tell their soul, I don't know how I feel. I don't care how I feel. I don't want to do this right now, but I have got to get to a different place. And the only way I can get to a different place is if I focus on him. God, you are worthy. You are here. You alone are good. You alone have these days in your books. You alone know why this is happening even when I don't and I'm mad. Something starts to shift. And until we learn how to take control of our soul by the power of the Spirit, we are going to be wafting in the wind and hitting a wall that we're never going to get through. Back to that thing I said earlier, worship isn't an emotion, it's a discipline. You don't bless God to check a box. (laughs) You bless Him and you check your heart. And real worship is not automatic. I've also always dreamed of us, and I realize some of you say, well, worship's not just singing songs. Thank you, Captain Obvious. I know. It's a lifestyle thing. But that lifestyle thing in your songs, the way you love your wife, the way you love your husband, the way you deal with your kids, the way you treat, it is never going to happen genuinely when you feel like it. That is not biblical Christian worship. Christian worship is no matter what, highs and lows, I'm going to praise. I'm going to worship the Lord of heaven, not because I like singing songs or dancing or doing things like this, because I need it. i got to have it. It's not an emotion. It's a discipline. Discipline men and women who put worship into their lives on purpose in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, where they're declaring the goodness of God. They get through the wall. When was the last time you demanded the entirety of your soul to praise God? You ever get tired of yourself? I mean, come on, let's talk about this from the Lord. You ever get tired of yourself? You ever get tired of 
running and running, feeling empty, hitting the walls, being mad, not being who you think you're supposed to be. Do you ever get tired of yourself? There's a way out. There's a way out. You're not good enough. You can't do this on your own. You're not more anointed than anybody else. You shouldn't be 20 yards ahead. Whatever the enemy is lying to you about, um, there's a way out of being tired of yourself, and that is being full of him. Y'all, he's the God of heaven. This isn't church Christianity. That's dying. Church-based attendance Christianity is dying. And I say, amen. Amen. Let the real church rise up of imperfection and people who can go through hell on earth praising him with a song in their heart, trusting that this is not our eternity, believing and trusting in him that he has our kids, that if we stand for truth and love people the way God will be, no matter what happens, that God's church will reign, that we will see goodness of God in the land of the living. I believe it. When I connect to him, I don't really believe it in my in my. In my flesh and neither do you you need to take yourself out back and handle yourself you understand what I'm saying some of us blame so many other people for our issues some of it trivial some of it deep like you know abuse and all of these things But in the end, the devil's just, imagine how this, what does the devil have to do? We act like the devil's so cunning and, you know, he's so powerful. Now the devil made me do it. You know what? All he has to do is distract you. All he's got to do is make you believe the stuff that's in your head and not focus on the Lord. You want to think like I've been (laughs) listening to Chandler. If you haven't listened to my Chandler's Revelation series, go listen to it because it'll blow your doors off. But essentially, do you think your phone isn't a ploy from the enemy to keep you from praising God? Get up in the morning, you know you should be spending time with the Lord. What do you do? Boop. TV, extracurricular events, how busy you are with your kids. Do you think that all the devil has to do is get you, hey, hey, just, hey, just calm down. None of that extremist stuff. You don't have to do that. You're not one of those people. Just relax. Don't worry about giving. Don't worry about that stuff. That's for those those people, Christians. You don't have to do that. Then we go, yeah. (laughs) Disingenuous worship comes from the lips and the lives of forgetful sons and daughters. I love that. Second verse says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. <laughs> so poetically, he says that, bless the Lord, O my soul thing, and forget not all his benefits. And um, we have always said this, you won't do this thing all in if you don't believe that what God has for you is, is worth it. Are we going to be honest? Some of you are living lives, you're having, honestly, you're having the sex you want to have, you got the money you want to have, you got the time you want to have, you got the people you want to have, and you're convinced that if you become one of those people, that you'll lose all of that stuff. Here's what I think. I think most half-in people aren't convinced that all of God is better than what they have. And I have been that person. Hallelujah. Help me, Jesus. It says, and forget not all of his benefits. Um, you know, we think of a benefits package like, well, I'm working at Spirit, and they got a 401k, and they got a timeout. And, and we think about that, and, <laughs> and then when we think about heaven, we think like God asks us to do these crazy things with no reward, like what he has isn't better. Like, it's just, oh, he wants me to become a Christian and be suffering miserable till I die, and then I go to heaven and get the motorcycle I always wanted. Luke, I'm not hating on you, a little bit. <laughs> Let me tell you this, and this is, this is what David does. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And then he says, and forget not his benefits. Let me tell you, there's reason to praise. There's reason to be men and women who worship. And, and, and Paul is, dang it, David. David, just quit looking at me. Wink twice or something when I do it. Have I done it a lot recently? 
Oh, of course I have not. Yeah, you're dang right I am. <laughs> Y'all, I find myself sometimes so discouraged about the things I don't have, the things I want. And then I get so mad at myself because I'm complaining. It's like my little girl, Daddy, I wish we had this. I'm like, do you have any idea, little eight-year-old person, how blessed you are, spoiled you are, how much stuff you have? I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's like we forget that what we have is so, I mean, do you realize what you have in Jesus is so abundantly more than any of this stuff that we're holding on to? Can you imagine in a thousand years from now, you look back from heaven and I hope uh, you, you know, you, you look back from heaven and you look at these material things and these worldly things and this worry stuff that we're talking about now and you're hanging with Christ. You're walking with Jesus. You don't even remember what it's like to sin. You don't even remember what it's like to cry. You walk amongst the clean, no more condemnation in Christ. And you're like, hey, I was being kind of dumb. <laughs> God, he's so worth it. And David says, listen. Soul. Praise him. And by the way, there's reason. <laughs> and then David actually lists out some of them. And by the way, the whole kind of the whole book, the whole chapter of Psalm 103 kind of does this, so I'm just going to go through a few of them. He lists this, forget not all of his benefits. The first one he says, he who forgives all your iniquity. Like you want a reason to praise God? No matter who you are, I'm not a worshiper. I don't care, just stop. This is not introvert, outrovert. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the person that's convinced God is worthy and whatever comes out of you. Amen? Like, <laughs> Who forgives iniquity? What is iniquity? It's sin. And in the Bible, any sin, all sin, separates us from God. And that's why the blood of Jesus is so instrumentally important to us. Somebody say amen. Listen to me. I have done horrible things. I've cursed God before I was a believer. I've stolen, I've hated, I've done physical damage to people spiritually and physically. Uh, I have been a, gar a garbage dad and husband. There was a time once in my flesh that I threatened to kill my wife. Excuse me. That was gross. I threatened to kill my wife, y'all. I was so mad. Things were so violent. Yeah, I'm a real guy. Real sinner. But you know what? The truth is, is this. He is forgiven. All of it. All, every single thing you have done. And by the way, you don't get to dictate to God why you can keep shame over things you've done when the blood is washed it clean. Who are you to dictate to God what his blood covers and what his blood doesn't cover? You have no right. And you sure the heck don't have the authority. If you want to feel pitiful about yourself, fine. But that is not a heart that honors and worships God. And so what does he say? Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all of our sins. Guess what? Have you been forgiven of everything that you have committed in sin against the Lord? Yes or no? Yes. Bless the Lord. Yes. Praise him. We forget that the cross costs something. It's not just some stupid furniture piece in a church. It was the blood of Jesus poured out on that thing that bought your sin. We act like sin isn't a big deal anymore. 
As long as I'm not as sinful as somebody else, your sin was worthy of death. And the blood of Jesus washed it clean. What should you do? David says, hey, soul, bless him. Bless his name. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Oh, well, I'm taking a nap this afternoon. The second one, David speaks to his soul and he says, bless him who keeps, who heals all your diseases. There's, there's like verbiage, people argue, scholars argue, if this means like a spiritual, you know, healing, if this means a physical healing, uh, here in my great theology that overrides all other things, because I don't really care what most of them say, I say both. The Lord, all your diseases. Everybody say all. all. We live in a generation of people who are, if we're going to be truthful, we don't believe in the all word. Because we have our timing off. We have our when off. Robin Russell died of cancer. She wasn't healed. Garbage. She is completely healed of all cancer now. Amen? We don't get to dictate the timing. He's mental illness. So many of us in here, the battle of mental illness, we've seen God heal over and over and over again. If you knew my wife 20 years ago and now, if you know many of you in this room with our mental illness, God has touched us and he's done it through counseling. He's done it supernaturally. He's done it through medication. Don't you discredit all of those things. God heals all disease. We have seen people in this room and in Indonesia and in South Dallas be physically healed when we pray for them. Touch the woman's chest and her heart with tuberculosis after I preached a sermon in Indonesia and she said it was gone. I didn't do that. So maybe like, whoa, y'all believe in healing? No, I just believe in what the Bible says. And here's the thing. Listen, all physical disease will be healed. That's a great truth. The thing is, where we get confused is there's a timeline in there. People, some people get healed now. Some pe- all people will be healed then. <laughs> David says, how many of you have had healing of disease in your spirit or in your flesh? Say, say amen. Bless the Lord. Bless him. What if you're still battling with the physical thing? And you're like, well, God doesn't love me. He's not coming through because he told me that I'm supposed to be. Guess what? I don't know why he's not healing you, but I know that he is healing you even though you don't know it. God might use your affliction. God might use something that you're battling with for his kingdom and his glory. But I promise you when you close your eyes here and you open your eyes there for the first time and you see Jesus, whatever that thing is that hurts, whatever that thing is that's eating aside and cancers inside of you, it will be gone. Bless the Lord. Listen, tell your soul right now, bless him. I bless you, God, because I've been healed. Amen? Well, we are going to have late lunch. I'm going to just come around the corner. I, I want to make sure we, we get this one. Um, David says to his soul, bless the Lord who redeems your life from the pit. Uh, literally, you can render that verse, he keeps your life from going to waste. <laughs> so, um, I'll be gentle. How many of you remember when your life was... Y'all, if you knew me before Jesus, I can't imagine 45-year-old Rob without Jesus. In my 20s, I was a mess. In and out of alcoholism, fear. I mean, I was just a wreck with anxiety, trying to, trying to do life. I had no purpose, no meaning. My life was a pit. And by the way, there are a lot of people in pits in every socioeconomic class. We're just thinking like, oh, the poor drug addict, he's in a pit. There are people with millions and billions of dollars who are in a pit. Their life is worthless to them, and they have all this stuff, and they can't figure out why they're empty. Then how much money you have. Listen, bless the Lord, oh my soul, because God has rescued my life from going to waste. 
redeemed from the pit. Tyson, you were redeemed from the pit. Every single one of you are redeemed from the pit. Sometimes you should go back and take stock of the pre-Jesus you. Remember how you knew everything? Remember how you had everything figured out? Listen, I know you feel like maybe you're not where you should be. But praise God that you're nothing like who you used to be. How many in this room, their lives now has purpose and joy? And even though there's hard times, like God is so sweet in the middle of the battle, in the middle of the storm. (laughs) Your life has been saved. And as some of you walk around going, man, I live in the pit. I don't know know what brand of Christianity you're walking with, but you're not walking with Jesus. You need to surrender your life. The devil's always da-da-da-da-da. He's nothing. He's nothing compared to the power and spirit of God, the truth of God. Amen? (laughs) How many of you have been rescued from the pit? Bless the Lord. The end of the verse, 4 and 5, says, Who crowned you with steadfast love and mercy, <laughs> um, who, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like eagles. Um, it goes on and on and on. He, he's starting, and we're going to jump back into this next week. But, you know, um, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. David says, hey, soul, remember that I have the love of God, the agape love, which is unending, the mercy of God, which is me not getting what I deserve. And there's new mercies every day. I wake up in the morning, it's new. There's a clean slate. Bless the Lord. And he says, who satisfies you with good. You know, the only satisfied people I've ever met in my life are people that are truly, not just Christians, but followers who have learned to make him everything. They might be broke, (laughs) they might not have a lot of stuff, their family might be jacked up, but there's a peace and a power about them because they're satisfied in him. Unfortunately, that's not yet all of us. Let's just, uh, Spurgy baby, I can say that because we're friends. This quote is so good, he says, Let others murmur, but do thou bless Let others bless themselves when they're idols, but do thou bless the Lord. Let others use only their tongues, but as for me, I will cry, bless the Lord, oh my soul. What is he saying? Let everybody and anybody do what they're doing, but for me, just like David, bless him. I'm a bless him. Can 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 I just pursue you this morning, followers of Jesus? If you're hitting a wall, if you've never even thought about this stuff because you're a new believer, if you've been stuck for so long, my heart for some of you isn't that you're not saved. You're just so stuck. God's a God of freedom, not just deliverance. It's continual freedom. And listen, the person you have to blame is yourself. And I don't mean to beat you up. I mean, take the spirit of God that is in you and go to war with your soul and say, listen. He's good, I'm going to bless him. He saved me, I'm going to bless him. He took me out of the pit, I'm going to bless him. I don't understand where he's at right now, but I know he's here. I bless you, God. Can I challenge every single one of you this morning, including myself, to take yourself out back and whip the snot out of that thing. You have a war going on inside of you but you have the power of Christ in you to destroy the power of that flesh that has honestly been our daddy for most of our lives.